Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt where we read better, not more. Today I have a very special video for you. So the number one video on my channel by far is how to annotate a book. I think that's because it's quite a bit more general than say how and why Homer makes <laughs> Hector an empathetic character in the Iliad, which is rather specific, but hey, it's what I love talking about. So I have been racking my brain about ways to create other videos that would be helpful for viewers in a similar way that's sort of like widely applicable. But as always, I want people, I want to make it useful. I want people to be able to get something out of my videos. When they, they're done watching it, they like learn something new that they didn't know before. So today we're going to look at some common problems that students at like the high school and college level have with their English papers and ways to fix them. And actually we're just going to take a look at one today because it ended up taking me so long to talk about it and think about it that it's going to comprise this whole video. But if you have other problems that you need fixed, I have a few other ideas. We'll probably make this a series. So I have edited a lot of papers for people. I've written bad papers myself and I used to run my own tutoring company and one of the things that I taught was English and I helped students write papers a lot. I've read a lot of papers and which is why I have these opinions. And this problem is so common and so widespread. It's one of those things that you kind of don't notice until I point it out to you and then you're like, OMG, I have done this on every single one of my papers. And, it, and it, really what it is is it's like failing at the very core of what a paper is supposed to be great <laughs> which is not a good thing uh and you the other thing is that you may even get paper get like a's on papers that are absolute failures because you're a good and organized writer and that can kind of obfuscate the issue and this mistake can go completely unnoticed by very competent english teachers but once i point it out to you you're gonna see it everywhere <laughs> and of course the counter argument is like if it's a failure of the paper, but I'm still getting A's on it and everyone does it, is it really a mistake? And yes, yes it is, okay? Just stop doing it. So, and again, don't feel bad. I used to do this. I've seen this at like high level college papers. If it's just a very, very common mistake. All right, so let me write this down for you. It is a very common mistake for English students to write lovely, very sophisticated book reports but papers that fail at the level of literary analysis. So what do I mean by this? What you write actually never sort of like leaves the realm of observation to get to the realm of analytical reasoning. For example, a common paper topic might be about the use of epic similes in the Iliad. We're gonna probably talk about the Iliad a lot because it's like fresh in my mind, I just read it. A paper that makes this mistake will be a paper of observation, it will say, Here's an epic simile, and here's another epic simile, and here's an epic simile. And in conclusion, Homer used epic similes. That's going to be essentially the level of reasoning at which this paper exists. You may even use secondary resources to show that other people notice that there's epic similes as well. And this secondary resource may offer some analysis that is an explanation of why the epic similes are significant. And you re may report that other person's analysis. But you never answer that question of why it's significant. You never tell me if you agree with their interpretation of why that secondary source thought that it was significant. If I can finish your paper and ask the question, so what? So what if there's epic similes everywhere? Or uh, another way to say it is like, why is that significant? What does it mean? What do they do? How do they work? If I can still answer those questions and those questions remain unanswered by your essay, then it is an insufficient literary analysis essay. It does not do any analysis. So I try really hard to kind of like model this type of reasoning in my videos. I bring up observations in my videos, but I'm also trying to offer my thoughts on why I think it's significant. And sometimes I haven't figured it out yet. And I still point that out because obviously I don't have to turn it in as a paper. Recently in a video that I filmed for the Odyssey, I said like, hey, I noticed that when Odysseus goes to the underworld, he talks to a whole bunch of princesses in a row all of whom have babies by Zeus or Poseidon or some other high level God. This is obviously doing something on purpose, but I don't know what the significance is. And, and 
that's because I'm constantly asking myself that question. And that's really the end goal here is we're trying to figure out what it means, right? A, a way to think about it is like, I'm always trying to look for a through line, a unification for the things that I observe in a text. And you should be looking for that too. And the problem doesn't just happen when you're looking at like rhetorical strategies or rhetorical devices. It can happen when you're writing character analysis as well. So a character analysis is not a five paragraph essay in which you pick out like two positive traits and the negative traits for your body paragraphs. And then like in conclusion, Sally was patient, intelligent, and a big fat liar, right? Instead, a character analysis should include some entree into the realm of analytical reasoning. So for example, this is completely made up, that Sally's deceptive nature taxed her intelligence, but also increased her patience as she waited for her deceptions to come to fruition. She also used her intelligence to justify her choices to herself, often engaging in mental gymnastics to satisfy her guilty conscience. While essentially an immortal character, Sally's devotion to morality ultimate ultimately unravels her sanity. Her characterization reveals to us all our own duplicity, that is literally our double-mindedness. The narration therefore makes an argument that to hold two contract contract <laughs> that to hold two contradicting beliefs at once is the definition of insanity and will ultimately destroy the mind. So the difference there is that I'm actually coming up with some exclamation ex exclamation some explanation however tenuous of why a character might combine these traits and what that's sort of doing for the narrative or what kind of argument is being presented by the novel. That's me interpreting what's there on the page, not just observing what's there on the page. So the solution. First, you have to notice that you're making this mistake. And again, if you get to the end of your paper and you can kind of shrug your shoulders and say, so what, why should anyone care? That's a pretty strong sign that you're making this mistake. I often think of like these types of essays are kind of similar to there's the Saturday Night Live character. That's a girl that you wish you hadn't started talking to at a, at a party. Learn a book. She talks about social, political, and economic issues in a way that shows she clearly doesn't comprehend them very well. Her monologue is kind of like a soup of undigested ideas, well, that could be your paper. Your paper could be the embodiment of that. Your paper could be in the embodiment of that dude who repeats Joe Rogan podcast, but adds no ideas of his own, or even tells you whether or not he agrees with Joe Rogan's opinion. And, and again, it's, it's not about the person, it's about the quality of ideas that they represent or that they present. It's about the quality of their thinking and expression of their ideas that I'm criticizing. And I know that there were very few classes or teachers who required me to write at this level, to think at this level, and I truly believe it's something of a lost art. Some of the best ideas take time, take focus, take research. Sometimes you just have to sit there and think about it and like, like really let it digest in your mind. And our society doesn't really favor things that take time. It's a very instantaneous society. And this lack of deep thinking, I think, contributes to the polarization in our political landscape today. I don't think it's a modern trend. I do think it's easy to supply people with opinions and with a party line, with propaganda, and that goes unquestioned and unanalyzed. And I, unfortunately, I think cancel culture adds like only another layer to making it more difficult for us to question these established ideas because you know thinking di deeply is a difficult mental exercise it's like working out it's not really something that you know comes naturally or easily um, necessarily you have to like work it out in the brain you guys but if the, you add a layer of like moralization against even questioning the establishment and then you sort of like couple that with a threat of like social rejection and isolation i mean those are some heavy consequences that as a society as persons we face so not only does it take like the mental exercise but now it takes a certain amount of courage and bravery increasingly in our culture as well so I mean, I think we've all had that teacher where you knew if I argued this one particular way that I would get graded down because I know that my teacher personally disagreed with that idea, right? So um, anyway, maybe think deeper, but don't post it on Twitter is, I guess, my advice. Well, it seems I have wandered a great distance from how to write a great paper to how to survive Twitter, but they are really circling around this idea of having deep analytical type reasoning, both presented in your paper and maybe in your personal life and in your own opinions. But that is all that I have for you today. Until next time, I'm Alexandra and I'm still a bibliophile.